and a hearty welcome to one and all. We're back in the car for episode 172 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for taking this car ride with me here on this nice day in New York. What a shock. But if you're checking out this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platform such as Spotify or iTunes, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, turn on those notifications. So episode 172 will be the ninth entry in our popular and ongoing series of Guilty Pleasure Movies. And this next one is a film that I've probably seen at least 15 times. It features certainly one of my top three or four favorite movie stars of all time, Robert Redford, in a very kind of juicy, likable, and really the only full-out comedic performance. He gives kind of a lighthearted performance at points in movies like The Sting and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. But this is the first one where he really gets to show that He had it in him to do comedy. Um, He just really hadn't gotten the opportunity to be riotously funny. Yeah, there's comedic elements in movies like The Candidate and some others. But 1986's art, thriller, mystery, comedy, legal film. It's got a lot of genres going on at once. Directed by Ivan Reitman. It's Ivan's first film after... Ghostbusters, and this movie actually uses a lot of the same locations uh, as Ghostbusters, and the film is Legal Eagles, which boasts a really stupendous cast. Whether or not you say for the time, or it could be more recently, it is an incredible cast. So you have Robert Redford in the lead as a New York City district attorney, or he works for the district, I think he's the assistant district attorney, uh, named Tom Logan. He's presented as a very good lawyer. Maybe a little bit unconventional, but a very good attorney. Deborah Winger plays um, a private uh, attorney. She's not working for the government or anything like that. She's kind of out on her own. And she's smart, but she's not nearly as good of a lawyer as he is. But she's somebody who loves the legal profession. This is a character thing. She loves the law so much that she likes to go to court and just watch. And she has seen Tom Logan, Redford, in action, and very clearly she has a huge crush on him, and uses the guise of, no, I just I just go to court a lot, I like to watch. Okay. So the two of them kind of form an uneasy alliance relatively early in the film, and they get involved in a kind of strange and very unlikely art theft slash murder case involving a young performance artist named Chelsea Dearden, played by, at the time, still a very young Daryl Hannah. She was not long after movies like Reckless with Aidan Quinn and Splash, of course, with Tom Hanks. That was a big one for her, Eugene Levy. And she plays a performance artist whose father is a late artist, painter, whose work was stolen and some of it appeared to have disappeared and maybe she has it, maybe she doesn't. And Terrence Stamp, who was just knocking out one great performance after another in the 80s, he had the hit, uh, which he starred with John Hurt. He, of course, had Superman 2, where he plays General Zod. He did Wall Street with Michael Douglas very soon after this. And in this movie, he plays a kind of mysterious, uh, very, very shady character named Victor Taft. And another phenomenal actor, Brian Dennehy, is also in the cast. But it is Robert Redford's movie. Redford, and he had never done this before, he plays a single dad. And the daughter is not the sort of, you don't expect the character to be the way that she is. She is not the stereotypical, what you would expect from a Kramer versus Kramer setup, quite frankly, that she's going to be this sort of cranky, obnoxious, whiny kid. She is more than a match for him, and I like that the movie decided to go in that direction and have a more favorable kid character, and that he's, yeah, he works hard, he's got a lot of negative shit going on in his life, but he's trying. He's trying to connect with her, he's trying to be active and present in her life. Movie gets a lot of these things right. Now, the reason why it's a guilty pleasure film is it is, it does not have a good Rotten Tomatoes score. 
And a movie does represent a trend in Hollywood at the time that was not really a good thing in a grand scheme of things, which is that the movie was basically a package. They made the movie because they knew Redford and Daryl Hannah and Deborah Winger on a poster was going to sell it. And that's exactly what it did. And the movie was a box office hit. If it had been a quote unquote great movie, it would have been a bigger hit. But it is true, the film lives and dies by Redford. And as I say, for my money, his performance, he's just fucking hilarious. Even though a lot of very serious and potentially life-threatening, and there are some deaths in this movie, takes place. But the, the next laugh is always just around the corner. And Redford, as he later did, six years later in Sneakers, another movie that is technically has comedic elements, it's often called a comedy thriller, suspense comedy. This movie is in that same ballpark, but I would say is a little bit more serious even than Sneakers. So Redford, as a district attorney, gets heavily involved in this case with the Daryl Hannah character of Chelsea Dearden. He thinks she probably committed the crimes that she's accused of. Doesn't look good for her. But Deborah's character is convinced that she's innocent. And Redford kind of gets coerced and gets his arm twisted that he's going to end up, he's supposed to be prosecuting her, and through a crazy series of circumstances, he ends up taking her case. And I don't always like Deborah Winger. I, she is an actress that sort of runs hot and cold. A lot of people like what she does in Urban Cowboy with Travolta. That's don't think that movie is that great. I really enjoy, I think Officer and a Gentleman is a terrific film. Louis Gossett Jr. is great, and um, David Keith, terrific. Richard Gere, okay. I mean, all right. But her performance there is really solid, and I, th I think that I think she really nails it. I, similar to Redford, this is one of the most lighthearted performances of her career, and my perception, just as somebody who is a huge fan of a lot of movies in the 80s, and a lot of movies that Deborah Winger was in, even the movie Betrayed, which a lot of people didn't really like. I thought she did a good job in that. I thought she was very, very solid. She seems to be having fun. And it's almost like, especially if you know that Deborah Winger had this reputation for being difficult sometimes to work with. I mean, like Val Kilmer too, and Dustin Hoppin, there were plenty of people, big names. Not everybody is on and easy to work with 100% of the time. But I don't know if it's that she in real life had a crush on Redford or if she just adored him and didn't want to fuck up a chance to work with him. But the chemistry between Redford and Winger is really good. And I don't mean sexual chemistry. I just mean that when they're on screen together, the movie is on another level. Some of the other stuff with, with Stamp's character and when Daryl Hannah is on screen alone with some of the other, it's not as good. But every scene that Redford is in, I think, is a home run. And he's in probably three quarters of the movie. But the, the film does things you're not expecting. It has these comedic asides in the realm of this, at least theoretically, very serious story about a young woman accused of murder and art theft in the amount of, you know, tens of millions of dollars. And she's clearly very disturbed. And she's been traumatized by the fact that her father either died tragically or was murdered. And there's just a lot of stuff going on, but the movie still has these surprising comedic beats. And there's, I think it's just an amazing sequence where both Redford and Deborah Winger can't sleep. And it's 1986. The movie was shot probably in late 1985. There's no internet. They can't do a video call. They're not going to see each other at three in the morning. They would have to call each other on a landline, and each one probably thinks the other is asleep. But Deborah can't sleep. She's frustrated. She's not sure what's going to happen with her client. Is Redford going to help her? Does he like me? Whatever's going on in her mind. And she's eating and eating and eating, and, and it looks like Deborah's really going for it. She's eating ice cream. She's having, oh, I, she was having cold hot dogs. And even Redford gets into it. He has a little stationary bike. He starts riding it around his apartment. And then he starts dancing. He does a Fred Astaire number. It's fucking great. It's a little bit like many years later in um, What Women Want when Mel Gibson does that trick with the, with the hat 
and he does his own version of a kind of Fred Astaire uh, dance sequence. Redford is much more, he's much more coordinated. And it's just like, it's great when you, especially if you don't know this movie, when you see someone who is not known to do a certain thing, not only do it, but do it brilliantly. And Redford's not asked to do any heavy lifting here. This is not a serious, dramatic performance. He knows when to tighten up and to read his lines like he's in The Natural or Brubaker or, you know, a more serious, dramatic film. But the smile is always there. It's always ready. And the story is not really that important. This is a movie about movie stars. And it's similar to a decade later when Redford made Up Close and Personal with uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. And when I say similar, meaning you can go into intricacies of the plot, but it's not really about the plot. It's about the fact that there are certain people who just look right on screen, especially at certain points of their career. And Redford was pushing 50 here. He still had to, he still had the body of a, a college running back, a football player. He's, the guy still looked ridiculous. The hair was still perfect. It didn't look like he was even coloring it. He just had perfect hair. And he just, every time he's on screen, it's just like, the fucking guy, you know? And Warren Beatty had that to a lesser extent, but Beatty didn't really have movies like this, where he got to at least look like he was having a blast. And Redford looks like he's having fun. And because of that, we as the audience are more likely to enjoy it. Because the actor, he's into it, and the, the mystery of Daryl Hannah's character, and uh, what Brian Dennehy does in this film is terrific. And Dennehy shot two terrific, well, I consider this movie a good movie, even though the critics trashed it. That's why it's guilty pleasure. 44% on Rotten Tomatoes, given the pedigree, is a really shitty score. But um, Brian Dennehy, right around the same time, and the reason I say it this way, there are character actors who constantly change their, let's say, weight, their mustache, beard, length of hair, whatever it might be. You watch this movie, do a double feature, a Brian Dennehy 1986 double feature. You show this movie and what is clearly a better movie, and one that I'm definitely going to talk about on the channel in more detail, FX. Uh, starring terrific Brian Brown. Brian Brown is fucking awesome. You want to talk about an underrated performer, a home run hitter? Brian Brown. Look at Dennehy in this movie and in FX. It almost seems that he's wearing some of the same wardrobe choices. I feel like he, he may have been shooting the two films concurrently enough where there were certain things that were shot on the same day. I'm telling you, it looks like he's got the same outfit on in both movies and a couple of scenes. Dennehy's character is more interesting in this movie um, than in FX, because FX, it's a supporting role. He is basically, um, he's kind of like Brian Brown's foil in that movie. Brian Brown plays a movie special effects man who pretends he sets up what amounts to a mob hit, but not a real mob hit. He wants people to think that a crime boss is dead when he isn't. And then the FBI tries to bump him off because he knows shit that he shouldn't know. That's a really good movie. So all the actors in this film, they were all committed, as my sister would say, committed to the bit. And without going into heavy spoiler territory, because the film is light and frothy, and if you're a fan of Ghostbusters, you will see numerous locations where you'll say, wait a minute, that's the building of, hey, isn't that where they did this in Ghostbusters? Isn't that where they... The answer is yes, yes, and yes. I think they used five major locations from Ghostbusters in Legal Eagles. Reitman had the permits and he, he did what he had to do. And Reitman's direction is tight. Even though I don't know if his original intention was to make the movie more comedic than it ended up being or more of a thriller, but I, I know there are certain critics of the day, like New York Newsday, and Jack Matthews was a great critic in his day. Jack Matthews really liked the movie, and he called it a hybrid. He said, this is a Hollywood hybrid that works because it's about so many different things. It shouldn't work, but there is a kind of alchemy with all the performers, and especially the way Redford has incredible chemistry with Daryl Hannah, more in a sexual way, and Deborah Winger, just as 
the connection that they make, which is not based on heat. It's based on some level of mutual respect and the fact that he gets such a kick out of her and whether or not that's the character of Tom Logan or Redford just getting a kick out of Deborah Winger, I don't know. But their interactions don't feel like they're reading from a script or memorizing lines. Their interactions are very natural and that also that also helps the movie. So the, the Daryl Hannah character, I guess you could say this is a bit of a cliche that she is tra- has been traumatized, she's disturbed, and she is hypersexualized. From the instant she meets Tom Logan, you know that she wants to get his clothes off. And he sort of plays it cool and coy. Spoiler alert. At a kind of pivotal moment in the movie, she just shows up at his apartment, and before you know it, they have... S-E-X. Yes. And then, somehow, through movie magic, or I don't even know what contortions of plot, in come the police. Now, the police know who he is. He works for the district attorney's office. This is a home run hitter of an attorney. So they're actually breaking in to arrest the Chelsea character, Daryl Hannah. And one of the cops can't resist it. One guy says, Miss Dearden, you have the right to an attorney. And another cop goes, eh, looks like she already had hers. Meaning because, yeah, wink, wink, exactly. And Redford goes, hey, (laughs) just the way he says, hey, bro, you're caught. You're screwed, no pun intended. So um, that leads to a lot of problems with the DA's office and then there's a a really hilarious scene where Redford either quits or gets fired I think they're going to fire him and he quits before he can get fired and the original ending, and this is interesting I always found this interesting, thanks to the internet, because this movie came out in 86 right around the time of Sylvester Stallone's Cobra I believe it came out in May and when it was released it got decent reviews and a lot of people went to see it. No Redford had been in The Natural which didn't, it was, it was a hit, it wasn't a huge box office hit but it certainly gained popularity when it hit VHS and HBO and everything like that. People loved it and Out of Africa, his previous film had been a huge box office hit and won a ton of Oscars including Best Picture. So Redford was definitely on a high and people went to see this movie they, um, a lot of people enjoyed it, but there wasn't, there wasn't any talk about production issues or issues with the ending. And apparently the original shooting script had a very strange ending where the character of Chelsea Dearden, Daryl, Daryl's character, she's accused of two murders. She's innocent one, but she committed the other. And I don't know who thought that was a good idea. But that was shot. They shot that ending, and they also shot an ending where she was innocent of both crimes, and the movie, sorry, spoiler alert, 38 years later, the movie was not going to be a murder mystery where now we've got to get Chelsea, we got her off, but she actually committed this crime. This is not that movie. But it's interesting that this film, which was and is so lighthearted and has so many humorous moments, within some moments of genuine suspense where it looks like um, on Liberty Island at Redford and uh, I think it's Liberty Island. It could be Roosevelt Island. Redford and Deborah Winger are going to get blown up by a bomb and there's a ticking clock like a classic digital readout. You've got six seconds. You've got five seconds. You've got five. There are scenes like that. But this isn't the kind of story that you would expect. So maybe the original script was a little darker. I don't know. But I have never seen that ending They didn't release it when the film came out on DVD. It wasn't a big enough title where they were going to do any kind of special edition or two-disc set or let's talk to Ivan Reitman about the different versions of this film. There wasn't anything like that. But I'm still interested, and as far as I know, the alternate ending, it's appeared on TV. I haven't seen it, but I remember back in the day somebody telling me that they had, when I say back in the day, I mean like literally 25 years ago, somebody watched the movie on... um, what used to be just a Channel 11 WPIX in New York, 
and they said, bro, this, I don't know what the fuck I'm looking at. I've seen this movie and the ending is completely different or words to that effect. But I don't believe that the so-called alternate ending or original ending, which wasn't used, I don't think that it has ever landed on YouTube or anything, or if it has only recently, because it wasn't that long ago that I watched this movie with my sister and I told her what I just told you here. And the alternate, it was not, it was not on YouTube. So having said that, the movie is on Netflix and I, I recommend it. It is a product of its time. There are dated elements, but if you want, you, you like suspense, you like mystery, but lighthearted is okay. This is a fun movie. And I, I feel like because it was Redford, it was graded more harshly. And even Roger Ebert, who you know that I adore Roger Ebert, he just thought the movie didn't have a, he called it pointless. He thought it was just okay, like marginal thumbs up, thumbs down, like pick one. It was well done. The movie just didn't land for him. And he was a huge Redford fan. There are Redford movies a lot of people didn't like, like Brew Baker, he was a big fan of. Great Waldo Pepper. But uh, I was surprised when I found out the film was on Netflix. It's been on Netflix for a couple of months. I don't know if it's leaving anytime soon, but it's worth seeing. It's, it's a good movie. I, I mean, I call it a guilty pleasure just because so many critics trashed it. And it's remembered not fondly as an example of the Hollywood machinery just putting together packages with scripts that were not worthy of the talents of the actors. I don't know if that's necessarily true. I think that this movie was worthy. I think it's super entertaining all the way through, even if the villains are a little one note and the Daryl Hannah character of Chelsea is absurd. And like you say to yourself, okay, well this character wouldn't be this way. I like all the performances though. And it is the most likable that Deborah Winger has ever played in a movie, in my opinion. And it shows that under different circumstances, if Redford's career had gone differently, he would have been a home run hitter in comedies, in just flat out funny movies. Be not just because of the smile, but because he has the timing of a film comedian. Guy was really, without necessarily being a great actor, he showed that he could do almost anything in front of a camera. And his deafness with the lighter aspects of this story and being able to switch sometimes within the same scene from the, you know, charming Redford to angry Redford to, okay, now he's funny. It's a good performance. Not the kind of performance that's ever going to get acclaimed because the film is, it's fluff. It's just supposed to entertain us. It's supposed to have the edge of the seat moments and also make us laugh. Uh, and also the movie was, um, for those uh, fans of, for example, Rod Stewart, if you're a music fan, the song Love Touch was written for this movie. And uh, it, they actually use it really, really well. There are certain films of the 80s where they just have music kind of blasting on the soundtrack without any particular purpose. They use the song, which is a terrific song. They used it very, very well within the world of this film. If memory serves, they play it at the beginning and the end. I know they play it at the end. And um, yeah, I like all the performances, even Terrence Stamp. Uh, this is he's kind of on he's on cruise control here stamp is just so damn talented he can do anything um his character is just very very one note there's not much more not much going on there but Dennehy is great and Daryl Hannah with the mystery and you wonder what her story is and Deborah Winger being funnier than she's ever been and Redford at the center just crushing it just giving a great comedic performance and, you know a kind of character that's not really a funny guy he's you know, working for the district attorney's office. He's a home run hitter of an attorney. You wouldn't expect that he would be a laugh and gaff machine. But in the world of the movie, he gets to do both. But he, he also, they give his character moments where we see this guy's a really good lawyer. Might be a little bit unpredictable, come across as a little bit eccentric, but he's a terrific attorney. Don't, don't mess with him. Don't sleep on how good of a lawyer he is. Number nine. And our ongoing series, Guilty Pleasure Movies, 1986's Legal Eagles, streaming on Netflix as we speak, directed by Ivan Reitman and starring the great, legendary Robert Redford, Deborah Winger, Daryl Hannah, Terrence Stamp, and a very, very strong, the late, great Brian Dennehy. 
This has been episode 172 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for taking this car ride home with me on this Tuesday here in New York. If you caught this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you catch this episode on the audio platform such as Spotify or iTunes, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, turn on those notifications. I'll be back with episode 173 real, real soon. Till then, peace.